Hello there and welcome back to the Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for the conclusion of the Whippy Gown project. In last week's video I went ahead and made an 1890s inspired evening bodice out of this black moiré material mixing that in with some different colors of green silk and today I'll be making the matching skirt for this bodice out of the same black moiré fabric and leafy sort of Venetian style lace. And then I need to construct the rest of the embellishments for this costume which is just lots of garlands of silk flowers basically so I'm going to make dozens and dozens of silk flowers and then sew them onto small garlands to drape over the shoulder down the front of the skirt and then in large tails sort of a wreath garland sort of bum garland for the back of the entire gown as well and although this style of skirt does go together quite quickly the rest of this did take quite a lot of time so let's go ahead and dive on in so I've cut my three skirt pieces out of both the moiré and the black cotton muslin again and again I will baste along the sides of these to flatline my fashion fabric down to my interlining and please do forgive my hideous headband during this segment I was trying to keep my hair out of my face uh, although it was at an awkward length or I guess it just in general is and therefore that's hard to do without one of these stretchy <laughs> silly headbands but I am just using waxed cotton thread here on a beading needle as usual for my basting going all along the side seams like the long seams of the skirt I am not going to baste the hem just because these fabrics are going to stretch at a different rate anyhow so I'm going to have to reach through the hem later before I put the bias tape hem on this so I'm just going to wait and once again, I will transfer over my darts using a tracing wheel and some chalked paper, but I will go ahead and baste inside the dart fullness again here just to keep these two layers together while I pinch and pin my darts. There are only two darts on the front of this skirt. These 1890 skirts are actually a very simple shape. They're basically an A-line skirt in the front and a circle skirt in the back. Uh, that's kind of the general shape of these and we'll definitely be drafting one from scratch in the future just because I think it'll be quite simple. I have made a giant circle skirt version one of these that I did for my sort of faux ironwork gown this dress here that you've only seen in snippets here on the channel because I made it before I had a YouTube channel sadly um, but I do still quite like that gown and that skirt I made without a pattern because it's just a giant circle skirt but tipped in an angled sort of way so that the ha front hangs with less fullness and the fullness is concentrated on the back. But I'm just going to sew my two darts on this skirt here today and of course give those a quick press and then I can sew my side seams for the skirt nice long side seams I did make this skirt a little bit longer than the mandragora skirt although I'm using the same pattern in general um, just because the mandragora skirt came on just a tiny bit short and even this one I still think is a little bit short um, but I do I wouldn't mind adding a ruffle along the inside edge of this skirt in the future so that will probably be something I do in future costumes uh, it'll help hold out the hem a little bit more as well I didn't put any hair canvas or anything in here. Again, I'm not concerned with 100% accuracy um, when it comes to costumes like this, at least, uh, where I'm just planning on wearing it for Halloween. You know, drawing on some vampire fang bite marks, perhaps, slipping on my vampire teeth, and hopefully having some fun Halloween parties in a spooky Victorian house in the future. Once again, I'm dressing for the life I want, not the one I have, so, uh, you know. I did have a couple of people asking if I've moved yet, which the answer is no. I will let you know when I find a house. You will know, I promise. So, not yet. Where it's, you know, going to take a little bit longer than I had originally planned, but that's all right. And for my long seams on this skirt, I will press those seams open and then I will fell these down to the interlining here. Uh, on the bodice you saw me, I just whip stitched the raw seam allowance. Here I am actually felling it down to the interlining to keep everything nice and smooth in here. But I'm using olive green thread, so it wasn't very visible for camera, sadly enough, which is part of the reason you can see now why I use white or yellow thread when doing this normally for camera. And yes, if you're noticing there's scratches on my hand, me and my cat play that hand moving under the blanket game quite a lot, and he has very sharp claws. So it's not his fault that he gets me, but he does get me quite often. 
And once my skirt is mainly constructed, I can go ahead and attach it to my waistband. Rather thick waistband on this particular skirt style. Um, I would probably prefer something a little thinner. Maybe in the future, something else I would change when making my own pattern. But I'm just matching the center of the skirt to the center of the waistband. And then I will pleat down the back. The front and side of this skirt are all smooth. Uh, smoothly attached to the waistband. There is just a little bit of excess in the back that you can pleat or gather down. Either is uh, accurate. Skirts do seem to have pleats that go towards the center or towards the side. I've seen both on historic examples um, from around this time period and I've seen gathering in the back as well. So if you're making a skirt like this, really you can do whatever you feel will be best or easiest for you. And I'll just run that through the machine here. Again, still using my black Guterman all-purpose thread over here on the Singer 99K, still using 12 stitches per inch and just a regular um, sort of standard sewing needle for all of this. I will press the top of my waistband in a half inch here so I can fold it down over that seam that we just sewed to sew to attach the skirt to the waistband. And I'll fold everything into place basically, fold everything down and then I will hand fell the inside of this down and sort of slip stitch the ends to look nice and attach two skirt hooks for this to close. The back of the skirt, the center back seam is just left open. The top of it is left open about, uh, I think it's eight inches or so. is what I left open. And then the, because the inside seam allowance is felled down, there's no raw edges poking out. You can also put a placket in there with snaps or hooks if you would like to. I didn't think this was gonna move around too much and I was gonna have a layer over it as well. So I wasn't too worried about my skirt coming open at all. So I didn't really didn't really concern me. What did concern me was after I made my bias tape out of some spare polyester shantung to go ahead and hem this buddy, uh, I noticed that a huge split had appeared in the black of the skirt. There was a flaw in the fabric back here, these little stripes in the fabric, but it turned out it was not just a visual flaw, it was a structural flaw. So it waited until I had put most of the skirt together and started thinking about hemming it before it just split right open on me like this. And wasn't I, wasn't I jazzed about it? No. Um, so this far into this project, I didn't have enough, you know, money or time to buy another six yards and make another one of these, of this moiré. So I just went ahead and slid some strips of fusible interfacing face up with the glue up against the back of this and slid those into the slits here. Of course, this split is only in the moiré, not in the interlining. So, eh, fun. So I slid some fusible interfacing in here and tried to kind of glue this fabric back together as best I could here, just giving it quite a lot of heat on the iron, but not enough to actually melt the moiré itself because we already had enough moiré shattering on me. And um, this is what silk shattering looks like as well, but this is just a flaw in this fabric. Unfortunately, um, I thought it was a visual flaw. It turned out to be a structural one that's on me. I should have double, double checked this area and made sure it was structurally sound before I cut my project out. At least it's in the back and no one will really ever have to know, but I just wanted to show you what, <laughs> not everything goes flawlessly uh, when I'm making stuff down here in the sewing room. No matter how long you have been sewing, random random things still happen. But I sewed a four inch wide bias strip onto the outside, right sides together, onto the outside of this very large hem here. Of course, with a curved hem, I always like to use bias to hem that. Uh, I just find it's the easiest and cleanest way to do so. And it was, I believe, something that they used historically as well. Um, of course, you could easily slip some sort of structural material in here if you wanted to use, like interline your hem almost with an organza, organdy, or horsehair to help keep it out. Um, you definitely could slip that in here and do a wider actual hem finish. And you can even cut a hem facing out of straight grain if you wanted to. I just like using a wider bias tape to finish my hems when it comes to historical skirts. And really that was it for putting the skirt together for this whippy gown. But of course I had some decorating to do, quite a lot of decorating to do. And first of all, I wanted to create a kind of belt with hanging sashes to go down the back. So what I'm doing here, I've, I've used my patterning paper. I held up a spare piece of that to the back of my skirt. I put the skirt onto a dress form. And then I just simply sketched and drew with my markers onto some paper, the shape I wanted for these sort of back hanging tails. I was thinking of kind of the tails that some Luna moths have with like long tails in the back of like a butterfly wing, that kind of a thing, or like moth or butterfly wing. So everything's always inspired by bugs with me for some reason, even though I'm terrified of them as previously established. But then once I liked that shape, I went ahead and cut it out of the mandragora silk. So I ended up lining these in the same black shine tongue that I had just used to cut bias tape for the main hem of the main skirt here. But I'll just bag line these back swags back swags? Sure. And I am sad that this was the last of the mandragora silk because it is such a fun color of olive green. As we know, I love all shades of green. 
I'm just going to run those through the machine over here, half inch seam allowance as usual. I just left about a hands width opening in one of these long sides so that I can turn them right side out. Of course, I need to clip my curves and my corners in order to do so smoothly. So that's what I'm doing here. Anything that was vaguely curvy or pointy, I had to clip. And then I will turn these right side out and slip stitch the little opening that I had left to be able to do so. Of course, the top was open as well, but I didn't want to have to fuss with it up there, getting it all through the top, like narrow neck of this piece. So, you know, just in general in my sewing room, uh, you know, it's a, again, a compromise between doing what, uh, getting the look I want and also not frustrating myself because I'm not always the most patient human ever. You would think with all the hand beating and, well, flower making in this case that I do, that I must be quite patient. I think I'm gaining patience with age, I hope, but it's still slow going. But I'll press this all smooth. And these tails are going to be the basis that I'm going to sew all my flowers onto, so they're kind of going to be the support for the flowers here in the back of my skirt design. And between these two sort of sashes, mirrored tails going down the back of my skirt, I wanted to include a piece of netting. I noticed on a couple of gowns from this time period, from this sort of like late 1890s into the turn of the century, that some of them had these sashes of tulle or of netting sheer fabric down the back of them, and I thought that was quite pretty and a good way to hide a little bit more that repair I had made in the skirt. Uh, really, only I will know it's there, other than me having shown you, of course, now. And I did uh, complain about it on Instagram, I believe, as well. So some of you may have seen that. Uh, because when your skirt splits apart, when you're about to hem it, you're allowed to be a little angry, I think. But I decided I wanted to include a length of netting as part of the trim on the back of this. Something a little bit more ethereal. And I did use some of this netting up in the bodice as well. So it ties it into the bodice a little bit more two, um, but I just gathered a full the full width of this down. This is about two yards of this netting, and I think it's probably 60 inches wide, if I had to guess looking back. Um, but I just gathered that 60 inches down, quite small here, and then I'm going to sew it to a piece, like a random piece of cotton double fold bias tape that I have here in the sewing room, just to keep everything contained. I just gathered that down by hand quickly, um, because I thought it was going to be easier to gather this by hand than trying to put soft nylon netting through the machine, because that didn't sound very fun. Usually I gather things by machine, but Soft nylon netting. No, thank you. Uh, this isn't regular tool. It's it's called soft netting um, from Mood. I can link this exact black net fabric in the description below. But once I had that netting contained into a sort of four inch wide puffy strip, I will go ahead and start constructing this weird sash belt thing to wear as an overskirt of my skirt. When you're making a bustle gown, there is usually an underskirt and an overskirt, if not more than one overskirt. And this is just a weird overskirt in some ways for this post bustle era gown. And I will pin my gathered piece of netting in between my two tails here. And I'm gonna sandwich the top of all of these in this wider, again, cotton double fold bias tape that I happen to have in my stash. So just using this as a belt, you could use something like a uh, Petersham or Grosgrain ribbon. You could use a small strip of fabric, just make another waistband, um, or even just using like a satin ribbon would be fine for this, any sort of ribbon. This is going to have a bit of weight on it just because the amount of flowers I'm about to pile on these back tails will end up being kind of heavy, but it is anchored to the waist, which is the strongest kind of point on a gown like this where most of everything is anchored to. So. Hopefully everything should be okay. I didn't actually end up needing any additional structure in these, although it would have been a good idea. I think if, if the flowers were any heavier, it would have been a good idea to interline them or maybe even put some buckram or something like that inside these tails. And I did just connect the two back tails with the little butterfly applique, as you can see. And then I was using some wire to thread these tassels onto a big bodkin kind of needle so I could stick these tassels into the end points of my tails here, which was not very much fun. Uh, I should have just sewed them on a different way, but you know, when you realize later, you look over and you see some tassels and think, oh, that would be fun. When you, you know, you didn't, there wasn't enough time to think about how to do it properly. My real last step on the skirt itself was to, of course, sew that same leafy trim down the front seams of the skirt. So both of the side seams of this skirt are getting that leafy trim and I'm sewing that on, tacking it on at the same time I'm sewing on these glass beads as sort of berries between my leaves. Sometimes I was sewing on three berries, sometimes two berries, sometimes a single berry by itself. I was just keeping it random. Uh, like like nature would, you know? Uh, trying to keep things natural here on my polyester evening gown. <clears throat> but I do love a moiré fabric. That's my problem. That's why I I've, I've always fall for moiré no matter what textile it's made out of. I just love the wood grain print of the fabric. 
um, let's not reprint. It's actually a mechanical effect that is achieved in ribbed fabrics. So it's a fabric that has a slight ridge rib to it, and then usually the fabric is rolled against another layer of itself through big mechanical rollers, and it causes this water effect, like water marbling sort of effect, on the surface of the fabric. Um, so usually it's a mechanical effect. You can print this pattern or weave it into the fabric as well, but that's how traditionally moire was done. I've also seen it called watered silk, um, but it was a mechanical effect that was achieved. Now here in the background, last month of my life, I've been making dozens of silk flowers. I had about a dozen peonies, a dozen chrysanthemums, a couple dozen roses, many, many orchids, but I wanted to create some more foliage just to mix in with those before I started putting the flowers onto the gown. And I thought, of course, it would be best to make some more poisonous leaning foliage. So I looked up some photos of deadly nightshade here. This is belladonna. And I thought this would be quite achievable. I went to Michael's and grabbed some berries, but I did actually have to end up painting my berries myself to be shiny black because they only had ivory berries for some reason at my local craft store. And I didn't have time to wait for them to, you know, come special order online. So I just grabbed some white berries and painted them black with acrylic paint. And then this leaf shape seemed simple enough, so I thought I could achieve that. And it would be good to practice doing a different shape of flower. So let's go ahead and try and construct some sprigs of belladonna to mix in with the flower garlands on the skirt. Uh, for the little berries, I created these little star-shaped pieces that I could mold to look like a berry casing. I don't know, what, again, <laughs> my botany knowledge is just not up to par with this project. So these little stars are going to look like the little wrappings that the berries come in. I assume the berries are covered in these folds that then fold back and reveal the berry inside. I assume that's how this works. I'm not a gardener. I don't go actually outside very much. I do quite like nature, but I like to admire it from a distance, um, sadly enough. Although in this case, staying away from belladonna probably is a a, a good idea, honestly, unless it's very diluted and they're using it in eye drops. I'm just using my flower iron with the smallest half round setting here to go ahead and cup these buddies. I'm cupping the edges of the petals the opposite direction and then really and then really squishing down the other side so these end up quite cupped. So I can slip them on over my berries like so. And I just put a little bit of my PVA glue on these, on the backs of the berries basically, and just cupped the little stars around them to create this sort of berry with a hat effect, for lack of a better explanation, which we are in wanting of. Then I use these sort of cross-shaped pieces to make my flowers. I don't have the templates for these up uh, or anywhere yet. I, I made these after I had made the templates for my other flowers. So if you would like me to make the templates for the belladonna, do let me know and I can go ahead and do so and pop those online if you are eager to make some belladonna yourself. I really just drew these up quite quickly. They're probably not, you know, the best world's best belladonna flowers, but they're doing the job, you know? This is actually the same leaf template that I used for the roses and everything else though. So um, this leaf shape didn't change. I just cut it out of this sort of dried foliage colored silk. This is kind of a tobacco colored silk that I had here. I was thinking maybe it's like you have some dried belladonna along your garlands and your dress. And if you need to poison anybody at random at the ball, you can just grab a leaf, crunch that buddy up into some champagne and you have a mystery novel on your hands. And for the flowers, I just curled the ends of the petals in the opposite direction and kind of cupped all the petals down so that they, I could fold them into one little long tube-like tube, tube -like flower, kind of a long tulip-shaped flower. The lack of botany knowledge really is complicating this. Um, once again, sorry to the scientists and the gardeners in the audience. But just slightly cupping all four petals from one side and then turning the very ends of those slightly outwards with my heated tool here. And I have a larger half-round iron tip for doing that like so. Um, of course, these flowers, in reality, I think they're different varieties of belladonna, um, but they're normally purple. And I didn't have very much purple silk left, so I have a couple of these pinkish, greenish colored ones as well. We're making it work. It's all a fantasy anyhow. Nothing is 100% accurate. Neither the gown is neither historically accurate, nor the flowers are botanically accurate, but that's all right. Then to put these little flowers together, they do have stamens sort of sticking out of their long flowers. So I wrapped some of these gold and white stamens with a wire as a way to start these off. I poked the center of each of my petal cross pieces, I guess, crossed petal pieces. 
whatever. You can see what I'm doing. Then I'm going to close these up by putting a little bit of glue along the edges of the petals and layering them shut until I have a little cylinder flower here. Just putting some glue on there, holding these, holding these layered shut with the stamen sticking out kind of wildly in the middle. Again, is it absolutely perfect? No, but I made these quickly, like in an evening, when I suddenly decided I needed some poisonous flowers and that we couldn't do without them. And I cut out some smaller little star shapes and again cupped those just like I did for the berries to serve as the ends of these flowers as well and kind of connect them down to the stem. Just again, trying to look at that image of Deadly Nightshade, looking at my quick Google image search results of Deadly Nightshade to try and mimic these flowers as best I could on short notice. This was during my leaf making extravaganza because I had made all the flowers, but I hadn't made any leaves yet just because I was batch processing these things. So I was making all the chrysanthemums I needed, all the peonies I needed, all the roses I needed, all the orchids. And then I realized at the end of all that, that I was going to need some leaves to intersperse with that stuff. So I finally got the right color of green silk into the sewing room and made a bunch of leaves in about two days. To finish up and assemble my belladonna, I'm going to cut some half inch wide, sort of centimeter wide, maybe strips of the same color silk along the 45 degree, again, bias, just like I was doing in the rose video recently. I'm going to use this as floral tape, only floral tape that is made of silk and matches. So I'll put a little bit of glue on the back of that and start twisting it around my pieces here, starting with the flower and then just incorporating leaves as I go. Um, and I wanted to have the berries on a bit of a stem. So I wrapped them individually and then combined them into the stalk of flowers and leaves. So I'm just twisting that again, just using that silk as floral tape. Floral tape kind of sticks to itself. Whereas this, of course, I'm putting glue onto the silk in order to be able to use it in the same way. But you just kind of twist and wrap and move your fingers down a little bit to incorporate these different things in here. I'm just going to go ahead and go all the way down this stem here. And then I will roll some leaves and berries together as well, and then roll the whole thing together. But this is just how I put my deadly nightshade together for this costume. I thought it was a fun addition. I would love to do a full bouquet in silk poisonous flowers. So different types of belladonna and deadly nightshade, different types of hellebore, some henbane, even daffodils are poisonous randomly. Uh, you would not think they're such a sunny and happy flower and yet they're poisonous. So sometime in the future, I will have to play around with some more poisonous flowers and we can do some accessories, either home decor accessories or bits on a gown like this. Fashion accessories, perhaps a poisonous flower hat is in our future. And I'll just twist these two stems together now that they're finished. And then of course, make quite a few more. I made about, I don't know, six, I think, stems of the belladonna. It's about what I could do with the silk I had left over for making everything else and the time I had left. But still in my leaf making adventure, I was not done because I decided to go ahead and make some poison ivy leaves as well. I had this stiffened, uh, this is actually silk charmeuse. This was back when I was trying to find an olive green color that matched mandragora. And you can see this one has got far too much blue in it compared to the other olives in the background here. But I decided that it would be a nice enough color to go ahead and try and recreate some poison ivy. So I literally took this lined paper, which is quite thin, held it up to the screen on my computer and traced the leaves from these Google image search results <laughs> for poison ivy. Luckily, I've never actually encountered poison ivy or poison oak myself. Once again, it helps to never go outside. Um, I assume if you hike or go into the nature, you do encounter plants like this, which the rash looks very uncomfortable because when you search poison ivy, you get pictures of the plant and also what the plant can do to you, which is unfortunate. Um, so for any of you who have ever encountered said plant, I am so sorry. It gives me another reason to just to not actually go outside. I like a, a like a paved nature walk, I always say, like a paved trail, that's fine. Um, but avoiding poison ivy and poison oak and ticks high up on my list of things to avoid. But I did think if I was going to incorporate some random leaves in here, I might as well have some of them not be random and have them be poison ivy. And I just shaped these real quickly with the same knife end that you saw me using on the other leaves earlier. Fortunately, I for some reason did not get any footage of that. So if you'd like to see me making some more poison ivy in the future, just let me know. And after the leaf making extravaganza was complete, I could go ahead and start arranging my flowers onto my tails here. So I have again, everything sitting on dress form so I can pin flowers onto these tails 
blank magic. And let's not talk about how messy the sewing room is <clears throat> in these clips because yes, it's a disaster. I've straightened it up a little bit since, but I need to vacuum again. The whole thing needs, after a big project like this, I've got to pick up all the rogue pins on the floor and bits of scraps of silk and things like that. So I need to straighten up down here so that I can feel sane again. But once I had pinned all my flowers onto my garlands in an arrangement that I liked, moving things around as needed, uh, adding things different places, I could go ahead and stitch all the stems down to the silk tails. The back side of the tails has a lot of like unfortunate, you know, stitch marks and knots of my thread and stuff like that. But it's on the back of the tail against the skirt, so no one will ever have to know. But I just stitched all these down, secured everything once I had it pinned in place how I wanted it. Similar to how I did the bodice last week, where it's just like you pin everything where you want it, and then you have to stitch it all down by hand. And I had some of these little red orchids in here as well, which were fun. And I do have the petal template for these red orchids in that original petal set. So that one is available even if I didn't show how to make the red ones in the other video. I think you can kind of extrapolate from the other orchid video how to put these red ones together. And my last step for this was just to arrange another little garland on a scrap piece of silk to sit over my shoulder on this one. So I have the two full tails of flower garland down the back. Then I have this smaller garland over the shoulder and another small garland down the front of the skirt as well. These are just safety pinned on so that I can remove them, wear them with other gowns and also so I can store them separately from the gown so they don't get crushed. And then of course, because I'm a bit of a masochist, I went ahead and hand painted and sequined a fan to use with this costume. And here is my finished Whitby evening bodice and skirt all together with its in its autumnal glory, even though it is still here just the beginning of August. We're not really into fall yet, but why not start early because we all wish fall was a longer season anyhow, so might as well just kickstart the whole thing with a big black Victorian evening gown. I do think this is probably my favorite costume I have made yet, even though the gown itself, like the main body of the gown, the skirt and the bodice, are in a polyester moiré as opposed to, of course, like a silk moiré. This is about as best as I can do for a moiré for now. Hopefully in the future I'll be able to find a rayon moiré or even just remake this gown in a black silk of some kind. Luckily all the flower garlands here are separate as those are the things that took the most time to make. I can wear them with other gowns in the future. And here is the Whitby Day bodice that I made as a mock-up for the Mandragora gown a couple of years ago. Here's what that looks like with the matching black skirt here with our flower garlands removed in its more simple form. The skirt uh, devoid of its extra extra trimmings and paired with the black day bodice and of course my hat which i have a harder time keeping on my head with my hair this short but you you get the idea i hope you enjoyed seeing this larger project come together today and thank you as always for watching and a huge thank you to my patrons who make my work possible as always i'll be back here with more sewing vintage fashion costuming and crafting real soon so i'll see you then bye